In this talk, I would like to give you a definition. That's the purpose of the talk, and I'll do it in the first five minutes, probably, so then you can check your email. <laughs> um, Diffeology is a way to make sense of differential topology on things which are more general than manifolds. It's not the only such way, but one of such ways. So a diffeology on a set is a collection of maps from open subsets in Rn for all values of n to the set. And these maps are called plots. And these are the maps which are declared to be smooth. And this collection has to satisfy three axioms, which I'm going to write down in a minute. Um, this is a, was defined by Jean-Marie Surreal. 1979 or 80. Um, there were other definitions very similar to this around the same, same period. Actually, the most notable ones are definitions given by Kuo Tsai Chen in a series of papers. Not identical. I'm, I'm going to give Surya's version. And a very good source about diffeology is a book that came out not very long ago by Patrick Iglesias, a uh, student, former student of Surya, who wrote a, so a book with all the very thorough book on the fundamentals of the theology. And what, stuff that I hope to tell you in the second half of the talk is joined with Jordan Watts, who's also one of the organizers here, in fact, one of the junior, junior, one of the junior organizers. <laughs> so there's a lot of, again, this is not the only version of how to do differential topology and things which are not manifolds. Um, there are some situations where I find the theology particularly pleasant. Um, one reason is that it's easy <laughs> to work with. And the situations where I find it particularly pleasant are two kinds. One of them is in infinite dimensions, and I'm not going to talk about that. But when you talk about spaces of smooth math between manifolds, for example, sometimes you want to work with those. and on one hand, you want to be rigorous. On the other hand, you don't want to go and check if this is a Banach manifold or Fourchet manifold. And maybe it's not a Banach manifold or Fourchet manifold, but you still want to be able to work and not just claim that you're doing things heuristically. And in that sense, you throw in that definition very often. Whatever you're doing now does become rigorous. And another situation which I do hope to talk about where I find theology very pleasant is um, to deal with quotients possibly even bad quotients, such as this set of space of leaves of a foliation that could be pretty bad. But then diffeology is a meaningful structure on those quotients. Let me give you the axioms for diffeology. Three axioms. First axiom, every constant map is a plot. Second axiom is the uh, only place where we see C infinity. The precomposition of a plot with an ordinary smooth map is a plot. So if this is a plot whose domain is an open subset of R5, and this is a smooth map from R17 to R5, then the composition is a plot. In particular, you can compose by the inclusion map of an open subset. That's fine. And third is the locality. Being a plot is a local condition. Of course, in the domains, we have the ordinary topology of open subsets in Rn. 
If you have a mystery function and you know that it's locally plot, then it's a plot. This is awfully general. The theological space is a pair consisting of a set and a theology on that set. It's a set. I st I, I, we, so one thing that makes this easier than fancier things is we actually start with a set, and our maps are set maps, maps of sets, everything here. So there's nothing stacky. Oh, no. The structure on it, you know, when you have a vector space, it might not have a topology either. So the structure, so the word space here indicates that this is a set together with an additional structure, except this structure is the diffeology. Now, since Sue asked this, in fact, every diffeological space does have a topology, namely the strongest topology in which all the plots are continuous. That is called the D topology, D stands for diffeological. But there are situations where this topology is trivial and the diffeology is still meaningful. We have a good notion of smooth map. map is called smooth if and only if its composition with every plot of the domain is a plot of the target. Composition of smooth maps is smooth. You get a category of diffeological spaces. You have a good notion of diffeomorphism. Just an isomorphism in this category. So diffeomorphism is a map from one diffeological space to the other, which is smooth, and that has a smooth inverse. In particular, it is by a bijection as a set map. And the usual, the, you know, the most obvious example is if you have a smooth manifold in the usual sense, it comes equipped with a very natural diffeology. Take just all the maps from open subsets of Rn, all values of n, to the manifold, which are smooth in the usual sense. And with a map between manifolds is smooth in the usual sense, if and only if it is smooth in the diffeological sense. With this standard diffeology, the plots then become are a map to diffeological space is a plot, if and only if it is smooth in the diffeological sense. So everything is, goes through. Manifolds then become, a, you can identify manifolds with a complete subcategory of the category of diffeological spaces. To get something more interesting, let's look at the quotient diffeology. So you're starting with a diffeological space, X. And we're going we're gonna to quotient by an arbitrary equivalence relation. So this is, again, very general. So x might be a manifold with a foliation. You might want to quotient by the relation which, where each two points are equivalent if they're in the same leaf. Or maybe it's a manifold with a group action, and you quotient by the relation where Two points are equivalent if they're in the same orbit, or it's just any random equivalence relation, if you wish. And there's a very natural diffeology on the quotient.
we declare a map from an open subset of Rn to the quotient to be a plot, if and only if it globally, it locally lifts. Let me make this precise because I will be talking about quotient ethiologies. plot locally lifts. And one interesting example is that of irrational tori. And this example was analyzed in a paper by uh, Patrick Iglesias and Paul Donato in 1985. If you're taking a irrational renumber, the corresponding irrational torus by definition is the quotient of the real numbers by the subgroup, the dense subgroup alpha plus z plus alpha z. This has a trivial topology. This can also be described as taking the two torus, let me draw the two torus as a square with its edges, opposite edges identified, and you mod out this two torus by the linear flow of slope alpha. And you get the same answer, because if you take a, just one section let's say a horizontal section for this flow, you're going to pick up R mod Z plus alpha Z. Um, more precisely, these two are, in fact, diffeologically, diff diffeomorph diff diffeomorphic in the diffeological sense. Of course, if you have a two torus, you can act on it by automorphisms. Automorphisms of the two torus are given by two by two matrices with integer entries and determinant plus minus one. If you apply an automorphism, you, you will again get a torus with an irrational, line, with a uh, linear flow, but the slope is going to be different after this automorphism. It will differ from the first slope um, by the fractional linear transformation given by this matrix. And the uh, automorphism of the tori descends to the diffeomorphism of the quotients. So, The resulting irrational tori are diffeomorphic. And the interesting fact, which was a very quite, quite a charming fact, I find, which was found by Patrick Iglesias and Paul Donato, is that this is an if and only if. So that if, although the topology is trivial, from the diffeology you can actually recover the slope up to the necessary ambiguity. Just one second. Yes. No. 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 Now, this has its pluses and its minuses. I mean, sometimes you get something which is too coarse and which is, again, the theology is not always the good structure to work with. So maybe I can already say something that you know, just to, for Eugene to be happy. For example, one thing that Patrick Iglesias and, and I have shown is that if you look at the um, naive definitions or sort of, I don't know if naive is the right word because they're not that naive, but if you t look at um, def uh, the definition of an orbifold given by Satake, 1959, I believe, or Hefliger, um, 
you can view an orbifold as a diffeological space which is locally diffeomorphic to finite quotients of Rn, and that's completely equivalent to those definitions. Nevertheless, as soon as you look at um, stacky approaches to orbifolds and allow your finite group sects non-faithfully, then you cannot capture any of that. You get a meaningful structure which you cannot capture by means of diffeology. If you're finite group sect faithfully, even if you took fancy approaches such as groupoid approaches, the theology does capture uh, the structure, although then you have to be very careful with what you mean by smooth maps. So some of fancier approaches sometimes give you the answer which is different from the theology, and sometimes you do want the fancier answers, except there are tons and tons of situations where it doesn't matter, and then you might as well use a notion which is very easy, which does not require language, and this, there's, this requires hardly any language. And there are more situations than you might expect where this easy concept actually gives you the full structure such as here. But yeah, when, yeah. So I've already mentioned what the D topology is. Let me write it on the, this board. You just put it on the board. Now, if you have a subset of a diffeological space, and this can now be an arbitrary subset, it does not need to be D open or anything of that. It can be pretty bad. It always acquires a subset uh, diffeology. A map from an open subset of R and to the set A is a plot if and only if its composition with the inclusion map is a plot of the ambient space X. And now we can define what it means to be a manifold. We can redefine a, a manifold as a certain property of a diffeological space. So the usual definition is a topological space equipped with an equivalence class of atlases that is topology plus some extra, topology plus some extra structure. For diffeology, you don't need any extra structure. It's just an adjective. It's just a property of a diffeological space. Logical space is an n dimensional manifold by definition. If each point has a de an open neighborhood in the D topology, and has a diffeomorphism. of that neighborhood with an open subset of Rn. So are these going to be houseworms necessarily, or is it like non-houseworms? At this point, I'm not insisting on Harstorff or second countable. And just like you do for manifolds, some people insist that their manifolds be Hausdorff and second countable, and some people don't. You could additionally impose that uh, requirement if you want to. And then that would be in terms of the D topology. So it depends on your favorite definition of manifold. You can ask for that too. <coughs> now, if the geological space satisfies this property, then these local diffeomorphisms do form an atlas in the usual sense with respect to the D topology. 
so. Now, if you taught a course in um, introduction to smooth manifolds, you know that there's several definitions of submanifolds in the literature. Probably the most uh, useful one, but maybe not very pleasant one, is that of an uh, immersed submanifold. But what do you usually do? You, def you define what it means to be an injective immersion. And if you want to talk about an immersed submanifold, you would usually you would put a topology on it or a manifold structure on it and then insist that the inclusion map be an injective immersion. So this having, so for example, um, if you take the figure eight in the plane, um, you can realize it as an immersed, uh, injectively immersed submanifold in two ways which are very different from each other. And that's not very pleasant because one would like a sub-object to inherit its structure from the ambient object. And the theology does give you a very clean way to do that. Now, in actual applications, we have, you know, when you say that the leaf of a foliation is an injectively immersed submanifold or the orbit for a group action, action does not need to be proper, the orbit is still injectively immersed submanifold, you're never going to get these guys. And these theorem that actually tell you that something is injectively immersed manifold, you're never going to get that. They will always, in practice, be the theological submanifold. So that's a special case of injectively immersed guys where you don't need to specify the topology. So let me write down the definition. A subset of a smooth manifold is a diffeological submanifold. By definition, if uh, with its subset diffeology, it is a manifold. And a corollary, if this is true, then in fact the inclusion map is an injective immersion. But this definition will rule out the figure eight. In fact, let me give you a, uh, let me remind you of a beautiful, beautiful theorem from 1973 of Hector Sussman, the orbit theorem, which, of which a lot of nice examples are special cases of it. Uh, Hector, Hector Sussman says you take a manifold and you take a collection of vector fields on the manifold. Actually, he, he allows the vector fields to be defined on open subsets of the manifold as long as the open subsets cover the manifold. And he defines an equivalence relation, just declare two points to be equivalent to each other if you can get from one to another by a concatenation of uh, trajectories for vector fields in this given set. The equivalence classes are called the orbit, orbits for this uh, set of vector fields. And what Sussman's theorem tells us is that the orbits are injectively immersed submanifold, but in fact, and maybe let me give it, uh, let me give it 90%. Orbits are in fact the theological submanifolds. I'm gonna give it 90% because I, some of these details they checked somewhat recently, so, you know, better let it brew for a while before we raise it from 90 to 98%. But basically this is how you can, there's the, to, to check that, there's 
requires just a one step more than Sustanon's actual paper, um, which again I checked, although recently enough that I would like to declare it 90%. And again, this is kind of, pl I find this pleasant because usually in Sussman's theorem you would say, okay, here are the orbits. Now here's how we put a manifold structure on the orbits. And with this manifold structure, this is an injective immersion. But you, you don't really need that. And then the special case would be, once again, orbits of Lie group actions, not necessarily proper actions, Lie foliations, et cetera. Correspondence between Lie groups and Lie algebras, right? I mean, if you have a Lie group and Lie algebras, the, all the subalgebras correspond to the um, connected sub Lie groups. Well, sub Lie groups in what sense? In the diffeological sense, basically injectively immersed. Okay, I think I'm done with the first half. Uh, so this is the, I think, the story part. I'd like to tell you about a particular, um, once again, relation between diffeology and more classical notions of differential topology, which is joint with Jordan Vats. And I'd like to do that in the second part. And I'm hoping to actually, if, you know, I think I'm threatened to be shot at 10 to 10, but if I make it, then I might try to give some proofs of the uh, non-trivial steps in this story. So now starts this new story. Still diffeology, I want to talk in the stories about differential forms on the diffeological space. So, you know how the th physicists think of differential forms, right? You, you, you think of differential forms, you just write it in coordinates, but there's a certain rule. Um, when you transform coordinates, there's a rule how the formula changes. And if you've ever tried to read uh, Suryao's um, book, uh, it's called Dynamical Systems, I forget the title, it's Suryao's famous book, you can see that in his brain he's thinking about diffeology when he writes his <laughs> variables taking, you know, his x, which takes values in a manifold. He's thinking of a plot. So this is a very good language for differential, for differential forms. Um, differential forms pull back, and we're going to define a differential form by means of what its pullbacks are to the plots. And this turns out to be equivalent to the usual definition in the manifold case. So take a diffeological space X, a differential form, alpha on X is a function which to each plot associates a differential form on the domain of that plot, thought of as the pullback. So this would be a differential k-form. And we need them to be compatible. So if two plots differ by a smooth function between their domains, we would like the differential forms on their domains to be the pullback one another of, of one another. We then have an obvious notion of pullback of differential forms with respect to a smooth map between diffeological spaces, because you just compose the plots. Here's a smooth map between diffeological spaces, and here is a differential form on the target space. What is the differential, what is its pullback? Well, we need to declare for each plot of the domain. Um, we need to associate a differential form on, yes? You mentioned the name of Chia that seems like it's referring to the same way of Chen. Yes, so Chen, quote, quote Sai Chen? Yeah. 
Yeah, so his definitions are very similar to Suryal's, absolutely. They're not identical. His domains are convex um, subsets of Euclidean. Well, he has different definitions in his different papers. If I remember correctly, this, his, defini his definition is not this. He has several different definitions. On the nose, his definition is not the same as the, the Suryal's because he, at the later, later paper, I think Jordan might you not know this. Do you want to say a word about that? What is the difference between Chen and Suryal? And was there this other paper that showed that in fact the definitions are equivalent? I think you no, checked. Oh. Uh, oh. Oops. Oops. I didn't know that. There's a guy who, dis who explains the relation between them, but Jordan, you'll have to tell me about this later. <laughs> okay. So, but it's very similar. Let's say definitions are very similar. Um, that's all. It's apparently not. I just, I just learned that they're not equivalent. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jordan. I'm glad I didn't embarrass myself. <laughs> okay. Um, So we've got the obvious definition of pullback. Which is the only definition according to which pullbacks, uh, composition of pullbacks are the pullbacks of the composition. And with these definitions, uh, the French reform, the manifold, you get an equivalent, um, you don't get anything new for manifold. The French reform is characterized by its pullbacks with respect to all plots. Okay, so the paper that I want to tell you about with Jordan, which I think is appearing on the archive today, tomorrow, this midnight, um, is about the French reforms on quotient spaces. And let me just remind you some classical stuff, stuff that is, again, very old and very well known. If you have a free and proper action of a Lie group on a manifold, again, if there's graduate students here, let me remind you very quick what proper means. Proper means that the map from G cross M to M cross M, which takes little g comma point M to M comma G acting on M, this map is proper, meaning that the pre-image of a compact set is compact under this map. This is basically tells you that the action is as good as an action of compact Lie groups. Compact Lie group actions are a special case. Proper actions, according to uh, Pelé, admit uh, slices. Uh, if the action is free and proper, then MLG is, in fact, a manifold. Well, what do we mean by it's a manifold? Well, OK, take the quotient of theology. <laughs> With that, it's a manifold. And then we can take the pullback map in the usual sense as maps between differential forms and manifolds. And the pullback map identifies the forms and the quotients with the basic forms upstairs. Again, ancient stuff, probably 1960s. Well, OK, old. I shouldn't say ancient. Um, and what are basic forms? Basic forms are forms which are g invariant and g horizontal. So the manifold with the group action, the form is basic if it is invariant under group action. And horizontal means if you uh, stab it with a vector which is tangent to an orbit, then it dies. Basic form makes sense for any legal group action on manifold. It doesn't have to be free. The quotient doesn't have to be a manifold. It doesn't even have to be proper. They're quite meaningful for those irrational tori that I mentioned. Um, And one thing that remains true here for proper action, not necessarily free, then the basic forms, again, form a complex. The 
cohomology of this complex is just a cohomology, let's say singular or whatever, of the quotient. So this was shown by Kozul for a compact group action and by Pelé for proper group action. And just to be very honest, res responding to Sue, when I talk about ordinary manifolds here, yes, I do insist that they be um, uh, Hausdorff and second countable. So in the theorem with Jordan Watts, we take a Lie group acting on a manifold. We don't even need to assume that the action is proper. We just, want, we just need to assume that the identity component acts properly. So if you want the irrational torus, if you want to view it as the quotient of the two torus by an R action, this assumption will fail. But if you want to realize it as a quotient of uh, R by countable group action, this assumption will be true, and that will be an, an example of our theorem. What we're claiming is that under these assumptions, the pullback MAC, once again, just like in the case of manifold, ident identifies the diffeological forms on the quotients with the basic forms upstairs. So when the quotient is a non manifold, we make sense of it in terms of using the diffeology. And I do have another 15 minutes, and I'd like to show you a little bit of the uh, non-trivial part of the proof. The proof has a piece which is non-trivial to my, um, let's see, w what is the most Okay, it's a question of taste, but what, what is the most difficult part here is to show that this map is onto. In fact, the rest of the theorem, you don't even need that assumption for the, like, just to show that you have an ejection to the space of basic forms, you don't even need, there's, there's, you need to, I mean, it requires some work, but you don't even need this assumption. And so basically what we need to show here is if you have a basic form, it actually came from the quotient from the diffeological form of the quotient. But what do we mean by diffeological form of the quotient? Diffeological form were defined by means of what they did to plots. And to prove this onto piece, we're gonna be using a criterion. What turns out that we need to prove is the following. If you have any two plots upstairs, which descend to the same plot downstairs, and we pull, we pull back by these plots, and they have the same domain, and we use them to pull back a form which is basic. This is the candidate for coming from downstairs. In this situation, we need to show that the pullbacks are in fact are the same. And that will allow us to unambiguously define um, uh, the differential form in the domain of these plots of MOG. And the tricky thing is, for each and every point of the domain, these two plots will differ by an element of the group. But there might be some ambiguity. If the action is not free, that element, might, you might have some freedom to choose it. And in fact, there are examples where it is impossible to choose that group element as a smooth function of the point. There do exist such cases. And those are the cases which are causing the difficulty. Let me start by addressing a special case when the group is finite. And in this case, for every group element, we're going to focus on the set of points in the domain 
where the two plots differ by that particular group element. On the interior of this subset of U, open subset in Rn, that's an open set where you can just fix this particular G. So everything is nice and beautiful in this interior. We did assume that the form is invariant. And we conclude that on the interior, we do have exactly what we need. To finish the case of a finite group action, we just then need to allude to the bare category theorem that tells us that the union of the interiors is, in fact, the whole thing. So our, the domain of our plot here is a finite union by, um, of closed subsets. In fact, the same proof would, for, prove what, proof would work if I said countable. The action would not need to be proper. So we can show that the union of the interiors is open and dense. The two pullbox coincide on each element of this union, so by continuity, they coincide everywhere. Okay, so that's not too bad. So we have our criterion for finite group, in fact, countable group would do this the same. In fact, a very, very similar argument is what allows us to uh, reduce the question that we're asking to the question of a co connected to the identity component. So what is the question we're asking? We have a basic form on the manifold with a group action. We ask, well, did it come from a form of quotient? A very similar argument shows that, well, if this was true for the action of the identity component of our group, then it is also true for the action of our group. And this is the reason why in our theorem, the assumption is about the identity component acting properly. We don't need the actual group to act properly. And let me give you one more ingredient in the proof. Uh, so now we can just look at the identity component. And now we can just look at proper actions with this argument. So is this true for proper actions? Proper actions are nice and beautiful. They have slices. And again, if you crunch a little bit with the details, at the end of the day, you're going to be uh, reducing your question to a question about a compact group acting on a linear vector space. Might as well act uh, orthogonally. Choose an invariant inner product. Might as well assume that it is connected because you just care about the identity component. So let's try to check our criterion for a linear compact group action connected, orthogonal. Action, and I'm going to focus on what happens at the origin. So here's my group, compact and connected. And we're assuming that it acts linearly on your vector space. This vector space might as well just be some Rn. Let's put some inner product like the standard one and see what we do. 
we want to apply the criterion. We have a differential form upstairs, which we assume is basic. We would like to show that for every two plots which descend to the plane, same plot downstairs, the pullback by this form is the same. It turns out that you can, it's enough to look at, um, we're going to just look at what happens when you plug an individual vector into this differential form. So I'm going to fix two curves through the origin in V, which descend to the same curve downstairs. And I'm going to assume that they pass through the origin. And I'm going to focus my attention on the tangent vector to the curve at the origin. I'm going to call those psi 1 and psi 2. And what we need to show in this situation, so I'm sort of just jumping straight to what needs to be shown, is that the difference of these vectors, oops, sorry, difference of these vectors when you plug them into the differential form at the origin, so this, you're plugging this into a k covector, you're contracting to get a k minus 1 covector, we want to get the same k minus 1 covector. So the difference has to be 0. This is what we want to show. And I'm going to use the, oh, running out of time. <laughs> OK. Um, So just to spare my life, um, this is not entirely trivial. We, you know, we can, one can prove it. One uses in a very brutal way the trivialization of the tangent bundle of the vector space V, and we can direct you to the archive article for the details. So I missed the... So I think I'm going to omit the details of this one. That's it. Oh, do I have another? Am I? I have another three minutes. I, I'm the one who's distracted. Somebody has a problem with that. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can probably do this in, no, I think I better not play with my life. OK, yeah. So Jordan, do you remember that? I mean, there is something, but you need to assume something like locally contractible. Like you, you need something. So, so first of all, when you talk about the Ram theory, um, um, like you want the Durham cohomology to give you the topology, right? To, to give, is, is that what you want? But then usually you would need the guy to be, to have, to have so, so, so you would be talking about the D topology you'd like the space to be like locally contractible in some form. And I think that Patrick has something like that in his book. I think he has something, I'm not sure. But there is some assumption you need. Something of the type of locally contractible. Or locally smoothly com contractible, I would say. Everything here is smooth. I mean, that is just, what you're saying there is the difference. Yeah, so what Jordan is alluding to, there's a different notion, which I did not even mention today, of doing differential geometry by means of um, declaring what are the, what is the sheep of smooth real valued function on a set. That's also very useful for a lot of situation, but I was focusing on diffeology. But I think there's also some version, but I'm not 100% sure. We would need to check Patrick's book. What about the form of locally I'm sorry? The definition is extremely general, extremely general. So, I mean, you definitely need assumption. And what, what I find pleasant in this theorem with Jordan as an example is to try to find relations between this and, you know, see what this, these notions tell you in classical situations. And 
often they tell, you, they tell you what you think they would, but sometimes the proofs are not entirely obvious. They require something. But You see, proper is a topological condition. Proper, when you say proper, that's topological. Now, the place where we use properness is in the existence of slices. So you could ask, oh, suppose that I have an action that admits slices, and, and in that situation, you could show, oh, the quotient of the slice behaves like the quotient of the neighborhood. Of the yeah, but proper is something that uses topology, and somehow, in the diffeological context, the natu and again, the only reason we have proper here is because we want slices. So, yeah. Yeah, so there is a notion of, yeah, go ahead. I guess it was the, the other notion. Yeah, the other notion, which I did not elaborate on at all, is this notion of differential spaces in which you define a structure on a set by declaring what are the, uh, in fact, structure on uh, what are the smooth real valued function. And this, again, has been defined by many people. It was axiomatized by Sikorsky. Uh, Schnitzky has a nice book he ju he ju that just came out about certain kinds of differential spaces. And there are interesting relationship between these two. But, well, yes and no. Uh, so the theology turns out to be very friendly for quotient spaces. Differential structure are very friendly for subsets. Like if you take the rational inside the real line, the theology would see them as discrete. The differential space would actually, structure would actually see that the, you know, there's something interesting happening with the you know, rational numbers inside the real numbers. So that would be an example that, of a structure which is detected by the uh, differential, differential structure, not by the theology. Um, there are a lot of situations that are particularly nice when, the boot, when you can actually recover one from another, and this turns out to be um, uh, the same thing as so-called frolicker spaces that some people have worked in. Um, Jordan likes to advocate the situation where you have those two structures which are compatible but not necessarily mutually determine each other. That gives you more flexibility. So there's, yeah, there's, there's stuff to say about this, and you know, all of these in some sense are very naive and very easy approaches, but in a lot of situations, they're very convenient to work with. Again, one has to be careful. Again, we're not trying to compete with stacks or schemes or anything, but there are a lot of situations where these structures really are very convenient. Are there any other questions? Well, I have a unfair question. Yes. Well, when I, at first, you know, when I saw that theorem, my first reaction was, oh, it's obvious. The thing which is surprising is that it's not entirely obvious. The piece which I sort of ran out of time it requires something. So for me, the surprise is not why it's true, but why is it non-trivial? <laughs> that, that's the surprise for me. And the same is true for other things. Um, I've, I've played a little bit, you know, I have like another couple of papers that have defiology in the title. And in all these cases, the surprise was that the thing was that whatever we were trying to show was actually was not as immediate as we expected. Maybe. Uh, oh, oh. You have a, oh, do you have a, an answer? What? No, I don't have an answer why it's true, right? But I have an answer why it's non-trivial. Why, why it's what? Non-trivial. Why it's not trivial Oh, I would love to hear that. Because for me, it was a surprise. The fact that it was not, oh, let's just, th th that was actually a surprise. I would love to hear that. <laughs> 